Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at your osmosis practical for your GCSE bar juice so we'll take you through how to do the practical, the graphs that come out of it at the end and what you can expect to see. Osmosis practical. This practical is to investigate the effects of different solution concentrations on a piece of plant tissue. So when we say plant tissue, it obviously contains plant cells. And the reason we're doing this with plant tissue is because the cells can swell and shrink, so gain and lose water, but they will not burst, unlike animal cells. The aim of this practical is also to calculate the percentage change in mass of the tissue, which will allow us to estimate the concentration of the cytoplasm in the plant cells. This may sound complicated, but actually what we're just saying is that when the cells are in an isotonic solution, so when they're in a solution that's the same concentration as their cytoplasm, there's gonna be no osmosis. There's gonna be no overall net movement of water into or out of the cells. So there should be no change in mass. So we're basically just looking for when there's no change in mass, that solution concentration that we've put the potato chips in or whatever tissue we're using, that will be a similar concentration to the cytoplasm of the plant cells. So something I should mention, because people often get confused by this, is that when we say plant tissue, any plant tissue can be used. So I've done this experiment with aubergine, I've seen it done with carrot, we're going to use an example today that uses potato, and that might be what you've used in school, as is it quite traditional. You can also use bits of red pepper, for example. So as long as it's a tissue, piece of tissue made of plant cells, that's all that matters. But the one thing we have to make sure is that the pieces should be able to be cut to the same length, shape or volume so that the surface area of all the pieces is the same as we know that that can affect the rate of osmosis. So you increase surface area, you're going to increase chance for osmosis to happen. So normally we cut them into like cuboids, so straight long cubes for things like potatoes, or we could do cylinders. So you can get things called borers, which completely take out nice, perfect cylinders of your plant tissue. And then you can cut those really long cylinders into smaller ones of the same length. If we're doing this with potato or carrot or aubergine or anything that's got a skin on the outside, it should be removed because this can affect the rate of osmosis because a lot of times the skin of the outside of these tissues, so the tubers or the underground root systems are waterproof or they're, they're a different type of membrane. So we need to remove those so we're making sure we're just using normal plant cell walls and cell membranes. The mass does not need to be the same for all of your chips or cylinders of whatever you're using, but they should be similar. So they shouldn't be wildly different from each other, especially if you cut them all to the same length, then realistically, they should be pretty similar. And you should use all of the chips that you're cutting or cylinders that you're cutting from the same piece of tissue. So from the same potato, the same carrot, because that means that your cells shouldn't be different from each other. The potential hazard here, obviously we're not really using anything dangerous in this practical, normal rules apply for things like glass, but we're using cutting equipment, so it could be a scalpel, it could be a borer, whatever you're using, if it's sharp, then we need to make sure that we always cut away from ourselves, not using the sharp blades towards our hands or skin, and then make sure that you're putting and carefully putting down those sharp blades, not near the edges of tables and things like that. So we're going to need to make a range of different concentrations of either salt or sugar solution, which is what we normally use. So we've got quite a strong concentration all the way down to a very weak concentration. So you could be using salt and water. So for example, sodium chloride, or you could be dissolving a sugar in water like sucrose. So you can have a range of concentrations that's going to look something like this. You may have done more or less and the values may be slightly different, but you're going to have a pure water, a zero molar, so no sugar or salt solution where it's 100% water. And at the other end of your series of concentrations, you're going to have something very concentrated. This is going to be a very concentrated solution of either sugar or salt. So there's much less water in that one in terms of whether we've got a dilute solution at the end with zero molar and then a very concentrated solution at the one molar. And then there's a range in between. 
So we need to be able to both predict and explain what's going to happen to our potato cells in these solutions. So in our zero molar, our 100% pure water solution, there is a more dilute solution or more dilute solution outside of the cells than inside of the cell cytoplasm. So the cells in that potato tissue are going to increase in mass, we predict, because water is going to move into the cells by osmosis. So if they're gaining water, they're gaining mass. So if we go to the other end of the extreme with the really concentrated solution, the cells in that potato tissue are going to decrease in mass because the water is going to leave the cells by osmosis and to go into the solution because the solution is much more concentrated outside of the cells than the cytoplasm inside the cells. So this is what actually explaining what's going to happen in this practical. And we're hopefully going to be able to see that in our results in our graph. We should obviously get a range of it changing from increasing mass to slowly decreasing in mass, depending which side of the concentration gradient we're going to look at. And if you're asked to explain what happened to the chip in the zero molar solution or what happened to the chip in the one molar solution, this is the language and the explanation that you would use. So I'm going to hand over now and Jen's going to take you through the actual practical and how we write and calculate our results. So those are my tubes and concentration 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and 1. I know that I haven't written it on there exactly. Now it is quite warm at the moment so I'm actually just going to leave them in the test tube. But if you've got access to a water bath then you can put them in a water bath. I have my potato chips here already. What we need to do now is to dry them properly. We are not squashing and squeezing the potato chips, that's not what we're doing. We're just drying them to get the excess moisture off them so that we are not going to affect the concentration of the solutions when we put them in. So just dabbing them gently, moving them around, making sure we get each side dabbed gently. And these we made using a small potato chip up so that they are rectangular cuboid shape. So don't forget to get the ends. And then once we've done that, we can start weighing them. Here are my tiny pocket scales, which I guess I could take around anywhere with me. But I've got the tissue paper lined up in front of here. So once I decide whether it's going to be 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, I can put it in front of it so they don't get mixed up. I've got my iPad here to write the results table down and we can get started. So that is 2.36 and that has gone down on the zero. So we can take that, just pop it in front of the zero one over here. So don't get confused. Check that it's gone back to zero. It's always important your scales go back to zero before you start measuring or you're going to introduce an error into this. Initial mass for 0 0.2 is 1.88. And then I'm just going to line that up in front of there. Check it's gone back to zero. 1.95. Line that one up. Now I know I have more here. It's so that if any are wildly different for some apparent reason, I can just not use that one. So 0 0.6 is going to be 2.23. Put that there. 0 0.8, 2.10 line that up in front and then the last one 1.94 so we can pop that on just there once we've weighed them and recorded we can take our potato chips drop them in to the tubes make sure they are fully submerged ah that wasn't planned that was just completely unscripted just poke that down a bit Make sure it is fully submerged. And you can see these ones over here at the end in the 100% secret solution. These are actually floating a bit. If I poke it down, the same with this one. Oh, that's just a bit, a little bit stuck. These ones are definitely floating over here. So you can see a very clear difference between over here and over here. We'll start my timer and we're just going to leave that for 20 minutes. If you've got this in a water bath, absolutely fantastic. And now will be the time to go and uh, do some reading or sort out your folders or whatever. Once these have been incubated, we can take them out of here, dry the potato chip again, weigh it again, and then pop the results in our results table. So we don't need the solution in here anymore, so I'm just going to tip that out in there as waste. Get that out, dab it to dry it. We're not squeezing it, we're not squashing it. And then pop it on the scales. Make sure they say zero. Pop that on there and write down our results, which are 2.36. 
277. And then we don't actually need that anymore, so I'm just going to put that one to the side. Oh, that one came out nice and easily. Again, dab it to take off any excess. That way you're not adding any extra weight. So what we're measuring, check the balance is at zero and write it on. I'm not squeezing it, just dabbing it to get all the water on the outside off. And now we've got our results. I can go and do the calculations. So you've just seen me do the experiment. Here is all of my data that I collected in the experiment. So the initial mass, measuring it before it went into incubation in the solution. Final mass, measuring it after it came out and it had been dried. We can now work out the change in mass. So we are going to be doing final minus initial. So for the first one, 2.77 minus 2.36, it has gone up by 0.41. 2.15 minus 1.88. It has gone up by 2.7. 2.05 minus 1.95 equals it has gone up by 0 0.1. 2.33 minus 2.23. Okay, it has gone up up by 0 0.1. Now the fact that these two are the same suggests that one of them is probably going to be an anomalous result but we will see which one it is once we have drawn the graph. We're getting very close to no change here. 1.61 minus 1.94 equals minus 0.33. It is really important to state whether it is going up or down in the change of mass because we are going to need that when we're drawing the graph. What we're going to be doing for percentage change we are going to be doing change in mass over initial mass 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 times 100 so it's the percentage change from the initial that we are doing not from the final not from anything else so 0 0.41 divided by 2.36 times 100 equals 17 point percent. 0 0.27 divided by 1.88 times 100 gives us 14.4. It is really important that you keep all of these numbers to the same number of decimal places. Oh, just spot it that I didn't put those on there. So remember decimal places the whole way through. So 0 0.10 divided by 1.95 times 100 gives us 5.1. 0 0.1 divided by 2.23 times 100 gives us 4.5. So we are seeing more of a difference between these two numbers than we are between these two numbers. So that is good. 0 0.03 divided by 2.1 times 100. And that gives us 1.4. And then... 0.33 divided by 1.94 times 100 and that is 17 that is minus 17.0 and then it is these numbers that we can use to plot our graph so we're going to use our percentage change to make our graph and that's obviously going to help us with calculating that same concentration as the cell cytoplasm but what I will say about this is that the reason we calculate percentage change, why don't we just use the change in mass? And the reason is because if we do percentage change, it allows us to compare the results from each chip because they all had different start masses. This means by turning it into a percentage, we've made the change in mass relative to their start mass. So that means that it doesn't matter what their start mass was, we can compare these results. Okay, so I have draw my graph. I've got my sucrose concentration on the x-axis which is in the middle because we're doing a plus and minus graph. So we're doing these cross axes because we need to go up positive increase in mass and down negative decrease in mass. And so my zero is in the middle. And I've gone, I should have gone from minus 20 to plus 20. I didn't quite have enough space but you can obviously go from minus 20 to plus 20 on yours. So my first zero point for percentage change will be plotted on the y-axis because that's where zero is. So that's about 17.4, then 14.4, so just half underneath the 15, then 5.1, so just above the five, then 4.5, so just below the five, then 1.4, so kind of almost at two, and then minus 17. Now, I would say that 
eight molar value, the 1.4, is probably a bit of an anomalous result. I would have expected that to have been a negative result. Even if it was a small negative, I'd expect it to be negative. So that's the one that I would say potentially, you know, I would expect that to be different. We can't change it now. It's not anomalous as in it's way out of what the pattern is necessarily. And this can happen with this experiment. You're dealing with plant tissue cells, they don't always do what we're expecting them to do, but we still have a clear decrease as we go up the concentrations. So I have drawn my line of best fit. And what I've tried to do with this line is I have tried to make sure that all of the points are within a similar distance from this line. And you could fiddle about with it for ages to try and get it more accurate. But realistically, in the exam, you're going to be given data that would give you a very nice straight line or a very nice obvious curve because lines of best fit can be curves as well. So this data is obviously not been selected for an exam question, so it's not perfect. So I've tried to make sure my line of best fit is as close to as many points as I can. So try and either hit the majority of points or get them evenly spaced from the line and ignore anomalies. So like I said, that 0 0.8 value is much further away from the line than the others, but I'm taking that, that that is something that's out of the pattern that I would expect. So I'm sort of taking that one as an anomaly. You could be given an anomalous result in the exam and you could draw your line best fit, plot all your points. They could fit all perfectly on a line except for one. And if that's the case, then that's there as an anomaly on purpose. So now we could use our line of best fit to estimate the concentration of the solution inside the cytoplasm of the cells of the potato tissue. And the really easy way of doing that is to find where there is 0% change in mass. So here my line of best fit crosses the x-axis at 0.6 molar. So there we go. That is a suggestion that that is where there is no change in mass. Obviously, we know that in 0.6 molar, there was potentially a change in mass because we saw it. So this is why the line of best fit needs to be accurate, needs to be placed properly. Okay, so let's have a quick think about our variables then for this practical. So a dependent variable, remember that's what you measure, is the mass of the chips. So we're not measuring percentage change in mass, we're measuring the mass before and after, and then we use that to calculate percentage change. Our independent variable is the concentration of sucrose, because that's what we are changing throughout the experiment. And then our control variables. So the time spent in the solution was the same for all the chips. We said the chips should all have come from the same potato. The length or volume of the chips should be kept the same. And the volume of sucrose solution in each tube should be the same. And we mentioned temperature, so the temperature should be the same. If the temperature of the room is room temperature and you're just doing them all at room temperature, that's fine. You can, if you'd like to speed it up, maybe use a water bath and then they're all in the same temperature for the water bath as well to control that. So let's just think about reasons why we do those controls. So the chips being from the same potato, we said that it could have different cell size plasma concentrations if they were from different potatoes or different plants. The length and volume of the chips should be the same so that the surface area is the same because we know that increasing surface area could affect the rate of osmosis. So it could have happened faster for those chips if you had different surface area. I've seen an exam question before where they did normal chips and then they did like crinkle cut chips. And the crinkle cut chips obviously have a bumpy surface, so they have an increased surface area. And they ask you to predict what would be the difference with the crinkle cut chips. And obviously then we can think about increased surface area, more osmosis happening faster, and therefore we'd get kind of a different result because they would either take on or lose more water. The temperature, as we said, that could also affect the rate of osmosis. Increasing temperature increases the rate of osmosis. Controlling all of these variables means that we are confident in comparing the results from each of our chips. Ouch! This is why in some videos I explain scratches.